Hello everybody and welcome back to yet another edition to my journey through One Piece. Today after the epic Dress Rosa video, and I mean epic in terms of length, we're going to be doing a little bit of a shorter one, and hopefully not too short because this arc deserves more than that, but it's going to be uh, much shorter than four hours. Uh, yet nonetheless, we're going to be talking about some really, really cool stuff from a really, really good arc. Today we're going to be talking about the Zo arc, and man, there is so much to be said about this one. I had tons of fun with it. I didn't really know what to expect going in, other than it's probably going to be a shorter one, uh, as Oda tends to alternate between bigger, grander, and shorter ones um, to set things up. So it did that. It was shorter than both Whole Cake Island and Dress Rosa. But it did so much more than that as well. It was fantastic. I I enjoyed it so much, and I hope you guys did too. And I'm looking forward to talking about it. Uh, but before we do so, uh, just a reminder that you can watch the next review right now. If you go over to Patreon and subscribe to the $5 tier, you'll get early access to the next video, which is Whole Cake Island. That may be done in parts. We'll see. Um, but yeah, additionally, you can follow me on Twitter or X whatever you want to call it, um, if you want updates on everything I'm experiencing and my thoughts and stuff like that, uh, it's mostly just me screaming about peak fiction, One Piece very much included, uh, you can follow me on there. You can check me out on Twitch, where we do these streams where I experience this story. Every single chapter is streamed live on Twitch, um, and some of the VODs that go away go up on Patreon so we can relive them and that they won't be taken down forever. Um, but yeah, Twitch is the place to go for that if you want to join in on the live reads. And, uh, you know, as we get towards closer and closer to Wano, which I hear is really, really hype because of a, specifically for me, I've heard that Wano is really, really written in places for things that I've been thinking about throughout the entire series. I've heard that it really appeals to my tastes, Wano. Um, I've heard that it's very flawed, but I've heard that at its peaks, it really appeals to my tastes. Uh, I, I've heard that it sort of is payoff for a lot of things I've been looking at throughout the series, so that is super exciting. So, you may want to join in as we ramp up towards that, because we are now um, a decent bit into Whole Cake Island. Uh, so, I imagine Wano's going to be kind of soon. But of course, in terms of expectations and all that sort of thing, I never let people's uh, words or hype or whatever uh, affect my expectations. If someone says Wano's 11 out of 10, I think that's awesome, but it doesn't mean that I think it's going to be an 11 out of 10 for me. As always, high hopes, tempered expectations. Uh, but yeah, lastly, if you want to discuss any of this stuff uh, in the streams, in the videos, nothing to do with me, if you want to just talk about One Piece with like-minded folk, you can join the Discord, where uh, there's a great community over there, and uh, there are tons of people screaming about One Piece in there. Uh, the link to that and everything I just talked about is in the description and pinned comment. Now, before getting into Lore Piece, the arc, uh, aka Zo, we have to talk about some AJ Piece comments from the Punk Hazard video. That seems like a long time ago, but uh, yeah, the, the Punk Hazard video. The first one is from Gio, who says, Always nice to catch your streams in these videos. One thing I've noticed about One Piece is how many arcs have a similar underlying structure where at the end of the day, Luffy will come in to defeat the villain threatening the island. I was wondering if you, if you had any thoughts on this story structure. It gives me a sense of comfort in knowing that eventually the Straw Hats will save the day, and it makes the arcs where this structure is broken much more powerful. Thanks again for the fantastic analysis and having such an awesome community around your channel. Thank you, Geo, for being a part of it. I, I am a big fan of that structure. You know, I could see how some could say it's predictable or boring or whatever, but there are times where it is broken in one way or another, or there's a subversion on it like Thriller Bark or Sabaudi, um, and those times really dig in and really affect you because of the contrast and keep things fresh. But there is that identity baked into the structure of the arcs, and comforting is a good word for it. I feel like it's tied to the identity of the series, that like this is what's going to happen. And, you know, some might say it's too predictable, like I said. But that reminds me of like the overall, the overall goal of the series. Luffy's probably gonna get the One Piece. Luffy's probably gonna become the King of the Pirates. I think we all think that's gonna happen. But that doesn't make the journey on the way there any less unpredictable, uh, beautiful, thrilling. And so I love the structure. I, I love knowing that it's going to happen. Once in a while it won't, and that's going to be really thrilling when it doesn't. Uh, but it doesn't really screw with my investment knowing that that sort of thing's going to happen because the journey on the way there is always fresh. It's always new. There's always new themes, new ideas, new structures, new settings, whatever. So yeah, I really like that structure. And 
I'm glad that Oda uses it. I hope he continues to. Uh, MTL says, I'd like to know, do you think that One Piece benefits from being such a long story, or do you think it could have been condensed? Or maybe that's just the thing from va that varies from story to story. I, I tend for that sort of thing, I tend to think that the length of a series is usually as long as it should be, because that's... Uh, it's baked into the identity of the series, it's baked into how the writer wanted to write the series, and I think with Oda, One Piece and length, I wouldn't want to separate them. Like like I've, I said this before, I think, could there be arcs that are more condensed? Absolutely. Could there be arcs that are tighter, and that I would maybe enjoy more if they were tighter? Yeah, and I'm sure there will be in the future, but... I don't want I don't want every story to be perfectly tailored for my likes and dislikes. I want every story to be an embodiment of its writer and creator. And One Piece wouldn't be Oda if he didn't meander sometimes, if he didn't ponder, if he didn't go overly silly and peripheral with random things, and if he wasn't very long. So One Piece is exactly as long as it needs to be. I love it wholeheartedly for everything that it is, and the length is a big part of that. One thing that was something I didn't really address in the Punk Hazard video. Uh, from Anime Problem, who says, In case you didn't realize it later, the Devil Fruit thing from Shino Kuni was supposed to show how Devil Fruit reincarnation works at uh, real time, as Caesar had the poison gas eat the axolotl fruit, uh, Devil Fruit, and it reincarnated into an apple after Caesar blew it up. Yeah, that confused me when I first read it. I realized retroactively what that meant and what it was doing. And so yeah, I got it now, but I think throughout the video recording for Punk Hazard, I probably just didn't mention it. So yeah, very important to note that. It's a cool way to sort of demonstrate that. But yeah, not much to say about this one, but just wanted to read it out loud because I didn't address it, so thank you. XD Goopa asks, Going forward, what would you like to see from Kuzan? Is he giving up on marine work, going solo to redefine himself, or maybe join or create his own pirate crew? In Eni's lobby and post, we see that Ohara weighs deep on his soul. I'm curious to hear what you'd like him to be up to. Maybe join Rayleigh and his wife as a bartender. Maybe. I'd like that. Well, the answer to this is actually a bit of a non-answer, because I don't have anything specific that I want him to do. Kind of what I was talking to before with the length question. I want Kuzan slash Aokiji. I think he's, he's always going to be Aokiji to me. Uh, I want him to be whatever Oda wants him to be. Whatever vision Oda has for him, that's exactly what I want him to be. I, I feel like if I think too much about an ideal scenario in my mind, it might not actually be ideal in narrative terms, and I might be disappointed for reasons that are unfair to the story if my expectations are not met. So I try not to do that sort of thing, and rather, I'm always just along for the ride. And obviously we can't just swallow everything and be like, whatever they do is perfect, because it's not. But my point is, I want Oda to do whatever he wants to do with Kuzan, and then after we'll evaluate if that was the right thing to do. As for what I can see happening, We've seen Sengoku change his tact. We've seen him change his attitude. Um, we've seen a lot of that. So I wouldn't. Be, I would be down for a similar sort of change of heart, uh, or or sort of lightening up for Aokiji, being away from the Marines, this place that caused such heaviness in his heart. I think that could be really good for him, um, loosening up a little bit. I watched Film Z, Film Z, uh, where he was pretty instrumental in that, and he had kind of shifted his worldly wise wisdom, his, his wisdom and his, his thinking about perspective and how he applied that to sort of Robin situation, and started thinking about the pirate life or the One Piece in those terms. And it all felt in character. It was very in keeping with Aokiji, he just shifted his, his sights a little bit. So maybe we could see him becoming a pirate and searching for that, for, for that uh, indescribable One Piece. Uh, I don't know how likely I find that to be, but I don't think it's impossible. Maybe he could combat the Marines because of how deeply he seemed to loathe doing what the, them doing what they did. Um, maybe he'll keep an eye on Luffy and Robin from a distance. Maybe he'll just watch over them. I don't know exactly, but there are a bunch of things that are in character that I could see him doing. Specifically, the way he looked at the One Piece in Film Z really interested me. It was very in character, but talking about something that he never seemed to talk about before, which I find really, really cool. Now, the last one I'll read in full is from Broken Sanity, who says, I really love what this arc does for Chopper. He's one of the least combat-oriented Straw Hats, though he does tussle from time to time, but giving him moments to be a doctor is immensely gratifying as a reader. Sometimes I think the fandom can disregard the, la the less combat-oriented Straw Hats post-time skip as they play less of a combat-centric role in the story in favor of giving that spotlight to other characters like Law in this very arc. I don't think that makes characters like Chopper less interesting or significant, though. It lets Chopper have time to impact the story while also giving variety to the actions of the Straw Hats in a way that keeps the story from falling into the shonen trap of measuring every character by their combat ability, which I am incapable of doing. Love the videos, 
Dress Rosa is my favorite arc. Uh, can't wait to hear your thoughts. I hope you... By now, the Dress Rosa video is out, so I hope you enjoyed it. Four hours, my god. Um... And I don't have much to add because I totally agree. I love Chopper's role. I love it in Punk Hazard because, I mean, I, I'm not going to repeat myself. I talked about it in the video. But I love that it's so in keeping with his character. It, it doesn't make him something he's not. And him being this doctor in this moment for these kids, with along with Nami, is just perfect. Uh, it's absolutely perfect. He adds variability. I love his personality and the way the monster idea keeps coming back thematically for him. He keeps things fresh through being less combat oriented. And yeah, I've honestly, I've been a big fan of Chopper in general. You guys have seen, I've, I've always been a fan of Chopper, but post time skip especially, I think he's been one of the best Straw Hats in terms of how he's been approached. Some people don't like how the Straw Hats get a bit of a backseat so far. Um, I have thoughts about that. I have a whole, I have this whole essay about why it's perfect for Robin, uh, her role. Um, but I digress. I agree. I love Chopper and Punk Hazard and I like him in general in the story post time skip a lot. And then I have a comment from Jonah Williams, which I'm not going to read in full because it's quite long, but I want to just draw attention to it. Um, it's a very in-depth sort of almost like an essay on my Punk Hazard video, so I'd recommend you to go check it out if you're interested. But it has to do with Zoro and Sanji and their relationship and how they interact with women. I found it very illuminating, uh, made me think about things in a way that I hadn't really picked up on. So I would definitely recommend checking out that comment. Um, it's a bit too elaborate for me to respond to in a timely manner for this video, but would definitely recommend reading it because I thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you for your comment, Jonah. And then lastly, from Sanji Joestar. Once again, I'm not going to read the whole comment, just for time's purposes, but um, who brings forth the idea, because I had been talking like, it's hard for me to nail down a theme for Punk Hazard. But Sanji Joestar says, uh, I, if I had to decide on the central theme of Punk Hazard, it would be the idea of double imagery regarding the characters involved. Um, the island itself is a representation of this dynamic, hot, half hot, half cold, two sides, whether it's Caesar, his savior attitude, hiding the horrible character he is, uh, members of G5, who are Marines yet known for their cruelty, and then Virgo, the double-sided nature of him, the sort of, and then I'm just, I'm just building on that myself, I'm not reading anymore, but like, you can think of the dualistic nature of Doflamingo's relationship with his comrades, or, uh, subordinates, rather, how, when it comes to those connections, him and Luffy are two sides of this, uh, are two different, sort of, inverse sides of the coin, and what's key is that Smoker is in the middle through all of this. And then Sanji Joestar goes into uh, an account of law, and how he's a great representation of this idea, a sort of uh, abstraction of this idea. And then concludes with, I feel that this duality between hero and evil sets the scene for the events to come. And I agree, so far at least. Um, but yeah, beautiful comment from Sanji Joestar, and a great way to end off this segment of AJ piece. Again, this is one where I kind of just uh, give a couple of thoughts, rather than reading out the full thing and giving a full response. But... Again, beautiful comment, and I think I agree. This is this was sort of a direct answer to my question of a key central theme, and I think I buy that. I think I agree. I'm, I'm on board with that for sure. So thank you for sharing. It's sort of uh, enriched my appreciation of Punk Hazard, which, you know, despite people downplaying it, it's a good arc. I, I really enjoyed it. Anyways, thank you guys so much for contributing to the AJ piece for this video. As always, just use the hashtag AJ piece in your comments if you want to be entered for the future videos. For Whole Cake, for Wano, Reverie if that's an arc. For this one, um, feel free. But yes, the Zo arc. What a, what a great arc. I had such a great time with this one. So yeah, I really, really enjoyed this arc. I think it did a, a lot of things that I think the series really needed at this point. Um, it acts as a sort of, uh, it does all the really cool, exciting, hype-building plot stuff that, like, Logtown does, or post the end of Jaya does, or post Eni's Lobby, or the end of Dress Rosa, where it just shows you all these sorts of things going on throughout the world as it progresses the plot and shows you all these different players and expands the, uh, setting and all that sort of thing. It does all of that in one of the most effective ways, it's one of the most effective examples of that in the series, and yet... It also tells its own story um, while ushering us in the... It, it's not a huge, fundamental, comprehensive story like a lot of these transitionary arcs tend to be, but it's more of a story than a lot of these arcs tend to have. They tend to be more focused on setting things up, and they do it beautifully, but they don't tend to have those self-contained, cohesive stories and thematic pieces, kind of like Dressrosa does, or Marineford does, 
or Skypia, etc. So what I mean to say is that it sets up all that stuff mechanically and does all the lore, uh, the lore piece stuff so beautifully, and I loved all that, and you guys know that's one of my favorite parts of the series, but it also did some other stuff that these sorts of arcs don't tend to. It introduced us to this new setting, one of the best new islands in the entire series. Uh, Zoe is full stop one of my favorite islands, and I'm going to be talking about that soon. But it also introduces some very cool characters, uh, expands the lore, like I said, progresses the stuff for Whole Cake Island and future uh, future arcs. It just does so much, and it's done in such an entertaining, fun, rich package, uh, while telling this very emotional, self-contained story that, like I said, while it isn't as sprawling and epic and uh, comprehensive, I guess you could say, as some of the bigger arcs in the series, it's still very substantial in and of itself, so I can't wait to talk about that, and a lot of these ideas that are shown throughout. I really, really like Carrot a lot. I think she's adorable. Um, something about, like, the, the way she's portrayed is so cute to me, and specifically, I start really loving her in Whole Cake Island, so I won't talk too much about it here, but she's introduced. She's great. Um, there's uh, there's uh, Pedro, who's, who's awesome. The whole lore around the Mink tribe and um, the things that the other the the other side of the Straw Hats did really interesting. The stuff to do with Jack, who is kind of enigmatic. Um, we'll see more about Jack down the line. And the sort of plot to do with Zoe and Wano and the Samurais there, uh, and a lot of the other characters. I I think I think there's a lot to do with the idea of connection here, of sort of common sentiment, even if there isn't common cause and how through generations that sort of thing can f can be transcended. Um, no matter what the circumstances are, the sentiment of people can speak through generations and through circumstance. Um, kind of similar idea to Skypia there that I see throughout the Zoe arc. Um, but yeah, well, let's, let's get into it. Let's get into the nitty gritty. So post-Dress Rosa, chapter 802, our crew are trying to get to Zoe, and they don't have Nami as the navigator, so they have to use a Vive card, the Vive card that Law has, um, along with Bart's, Bart's people, and it's kind of chaotic because they are missing their navigator, and I love, once again, I said earlier in the series how, uh, when Nami was sick, for instance, or just parts where Nami was out of commission, how much they struggle. I love how, again, that's that's in play here. They really would be nowhere without Nami. We cut over to the world government side of things, the marine side of things, where we get a glimpse of a man named Edward Weevil, who's apparently the son of Whitebeard, and his mom, Miss Buchan, who is claiming this. And they are out looking for Marco, and they are terrorizing and causing all sorts of trouble, and I don't quite know what to make of this chapter. It's very One Piece. It's very One Piece. Weevil's design is insanity, but he has just enough similarities to Whitebeard so that you can see the resemblance, I guess. Uh, I don't really know what, this, what to make of this chapter. I don't know if this is Oda just saying something about the way in which reputation inspires or legacy transcends and inspires in multiple different ways. You know, you have people like Luffy carrying out Whitebeard's will in a lot of ways through Ace through Luffy, and then you also have people like Weevil who are just like the bizarre, mundane, almost, side uh, byproduct of that sort of thing. I don't know if that's something Oda's saying, or if this is going to have key plot relevance. I would lean towards the latter because he did say that they're trying to get to Marco, and through doing that, they want to talk to the Straw Hats. They want to find Luffy so they can learn of where Marco is. Um, so I imagine in the future this will probably play a role. It's pro it's, I, I doubt that it's Oda just being stream of consciousness with this very abstract idea. But uh, after we cut there, we go back to the Straw Hats and we see that they the Vive card has led them to Zoe. And Zoe is magnificent as a setting. Fantastic. So Zoe as an island is an elephant. It is uh, a bunch of inhabitants living on this... Amazonian tropical looking rainforest uh, island on the back of this elephant that is forever wandering the seas. Um, it seems like forever. A thousand year old elephant that is just, just walks through the seas. Uh, what a phenomenal, amazing, imaginative idea for an arc, or for an island, excuse me. And I'm just looking at it now, there's this spread where you first see the elephant, kind of like a back view, there are clouds around it, you see structures on top of it, there is just this aura of mystery and imagination here that I haven't felt about an island, 
I think since Skypia. This is a bona fide JRPG location. This is this list straight out of a video game, it seems to me, and it fits so well with the One Piece worlds. But I, what I love about it is that the next spread you get, you see that its eyes are hollowed. Its eyes are sunken deep in. You can't even see its pupils. It looks haunting. It looks like a horrifying uh, face of an elephant. And it obviously makes sense, given that it's been alive for a millennium and wandering the seas for that long. But nonetheless, the imagery is very dark. Uh, it's very foreboding. And yet it still feels very One Piece. I think it adds this rich... Uh, the, the One Piece setting has one that's always been steeped in integration and little details to make the place feel real, and a rich history. But I've never been able to quite feel that history to this specific extent in Zo. Not to say that I haven't felt it before, because I absolutely have, but this unlocked a level to it that I didn't even know was possible. Just through seeing this elephant, what it looks like, its sunken eyes, beautiful stuff, such imaginative stuff from Oda, and it just, oh, I was in awe at this. What a great establishing chapter for this arc. And honestly, what a great establishment for the rest of the series. Let me just take the time now to say that a lot of Zoe and going into Whole Cake Island is full of cover stories being fan requests. So like, um, there's one here that's Frankie racing a shark in a ship designed by Usopp. Just fun fan service stuff like that. And obviously, a lot of these cover stories don't have a lot of narrative impact or any at all, but I find them so heartwarming and beautiful, and some of them actually do have narrative impact because they help me look at characters in different ways or attach myself to them in different ways, so I thought that was really cool. And I love the way that Oda approaches the cover stories at this point um, with these fan requests. He's done it before, but there's more in Zo going into Whole Cake Island than there ever has been before. But pretty soon we get something monumental, and that is that we cut to Dragon and his revolutionaries, and he is with Koala and talking with her about uh, all the stuff that happened on Dressrosa, and she's just kind of talking about all that went down. And it's interesting because I've been wondering aloud for ages, Robin spent ages with Dragon, you know? Uh, it's interesting to me that she hasn't talked to Luffy about this, as far as I know. Later we see that Robin did tell Luffy about this off-screen, and all my sort of questions were answered, and that makes sense, but I, it was just funny that, like, for ages it was an ongoing stream thing, and I'm just like, Robin hasn't even offhandedly mentioned it a little bit. I know that Luffy probably, like, he, he's not the type of person to be deeply invested in Dragon as a person um, and not care a ton, but just offhandedly, you'd imagine she'd mention it, and she did, so makes sense. Um, but what's interesting here is that they talk about their uh, their operations, and Dragon asks about Robin and how Robin is, and Koala says that she's fine, and she goes, don't you want to hear about Luffy? And Dragon says, nah, I've heard about Luffy enough already. Interesting. Um, but there's some really interesting stuff going on with the Revolutionary Army and the Blackbeard Pirates in the background, because they're sort of going over their weapons, uh, Dragon wants to talk to Sabo about something, and then we cut to Jesus for Burgess and Lafitte and Shiryu talking about the fact that they've found the Revolutionary Army's base. So this is really cool, just immense plot stuff that's really important here that is going on in the background. This Blackbeard Pirates versus the Revolutionary thing, it's been something I've been keeping an eye on for a little while, and it seems to be heating up here. And then we get a cut to the man the legend, Buggy. Buggy the Clown, who in the two years since, the first time we've seen him post time skip, seems to have become, he, I mean, he's amassed more and more of a following. He's a warlord of the sea, of course, and he has this thing called the pirate temp agency Buggy's Delivery Service. Um, they raise hell, they pillage, he has this immense charisma, continu uh, like uh, just as he did before in Impel Down and Marineford. And that seems to be continuing into the post time skip stuff. I really hope that we continue to get more and more and more stuff for Buggy because he is one of the most fascinating, even though we've hardly seen him for hundreds of chapters now, 200, 250 chapters, uh, he is still one of the characters I'm most invested in. And I think, eh, maybe not right away, but in the next hundred chapters or so, I would imagine that Oda would bring him in a little bit more, especially now that we've seen this scene with him. Um, but yeah, he has this temp agency and a really cool thing here in terms of the societal economics, socioeconomics, in the underworld, in the new world, is that Buggy's business has been skyrocketing lately. The revenue has been increasing because of Doflamingo's fall. That black hole has been in some ways filled a little bit by Buggy. 
and his weapons being sold. But also some interesting info is that Harudin used to be a part of his agency, and we see what happened to Harudin in Dressrosa, and he has now left because of what's happened in Dressrosa, so that's some really cool integration. And additionally, we see uh, a couple of faces there, um, or rather, one, one in specific that I want to talk about, and that is Mr. Three. There seems to be this, like, board of directors of higher-ups for Buggy's temp agency, and Mr. Three is front and center, and he looks like he's doing well. So cool to see him there. It's a tiny little crumb of Mr. Three. Now, back with the Straw Hats, we see that uh, Kanjudo has used his drawing ability to draw this dragon that is just struggling to get them up the legs of Zoe to get them on top of the island. Um... I still got my eye on Kanjudo, just saying. Now, it's pretty comical, there are some great interactions throughout this. Um, there is this falling uh, monkey that that is falling off Zo, and it crashes into the Straw Hats and Kinemon and Kanjudo, and they get separated. So it crashes into Kinemon and Kanjudo, they fall down towards the sea, but they call up and say that they're alright and they'll catch up to them later on. So the Straw Hats and Luffy and everyone else, Robin, Zoro, um, everyone, uh, Frankie, they, uh, Usopp, they all continue up. And there is this hilarious humorous sequence that I loved because this dragon, this poorly drawn dragon, cannot really, it's struggling to get the straw hats up to the, the top of the island here, uh, onto the top of the elephant, and so they're just willing them on, and it's this huge celebration when they get up there finally, but then the dragon disappears, and Robin tearfully says farewell to it. It's just hilarious, and Law and Zoro throughout this whole time are like, what? It's just a stupid drawing. Why is everyone crying over this thing? It's just, it, it was really funny. I, I It really brightened my mood. Uh, it, it really just... I don't know, it was great, Oda was just being super silly and really funny here, and I love the interactions, and, uh, I don't know, they just made me smile. But from that, we then see, um, Luffy gets uh, a vantage point and sees the expanse of the top of Zo, and it is beautiful. Again, the it, it's hard to measure up to the pure, the pure beauty and the, the mystery and awe and enigma that is this ancient elephant traveling the seas, this gigantic elephant, but on top of it, I mean, Oda just is completely consistent with portraying the promise that he sort of gave to us by telling us that there was an island on top of this, because the island on top is beautiful. Again, it's 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 like a jungle, um, but we see this gigantic whale tree in the middle, a, tr a whale as its trunk, and a tree sprouting off from it. Uh, there's a kind of a sunken valley with these sort of um, ancient looking temples and stuff, uh, hills all around, and just an expanse of interesting looking trees. It just looks beautiful. I can't properly describe it, but it's the middle of chapter 804, and wow, it just, it just relays this wonder and awe to you, and it is one of my favorite consistent things about One Piece. I hope Oda never stops bringing forth these sorts of locales. And, you know, 800 chapters in, you'd imagine that he would run dry in terms of the creativity tank, but no. No, in fact, it just keeps going from strength to strength. So they explore this sort of seemingly desolate area, and then they're attacked by a couple of members of the Mink tribe. One is Carrot, whom I love, um, and the other is someone named Wanda. And they're both antagonistic towards the Straw Hats immediately, which, understandable. Um, but the most interesting thing here is that Wanda is wearing Nami's clothes. So they're obviously really concerned and worried, and what does that mean? Um, and curious about what that means for Nami and the rest of the Straw Hats. So these skirmishes between Wanda and Carrot and the Straw Hats, these initial skirmishes, they continue. And as they do, they kind of move deeper into the forest, and Carrot scopes it out, and they go deep into the, the by the whale tree, deeper into the whale forest. And we see that the hard pirates are actually camped out here, and they try to help with the conflict between the Straw Hats and the Minks here. Um, Eventually, it kind of calms down, and then uh, we learn from Wanda that there that that Zoe has only been recently devastated here, and that it's due to a man named Jack, who we've seen glimpses of earlier. Uh, and then Wanda says, "We'll go deeper into the forest, and we'll find your friends." Luffy says, "Great, we'll be able to see Sanji." And Wanda just kind of grimaces a little bit, being a little bit secretive, showing that things are not quite that simple when it comes to Sanji. And as they work their way towards the inner forest, some really cool stuff. Zunesha, I think I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but the elephant who is the home of Zoe, I guess, or the, 
the body of Zoe, whatever you want to call it, um, begins washing itself, uh, bathing itself as they move inwards. And it's just a cool little immersive detail to the island, this moving, breathing, beautiful island that I really love. Um, it just it increases the richness of the setting uh, as they move inwards to meet their friends. At the same time, we see that Kinemon and Kanjudo are working their way back up using another drawing. This poor, poor cat. And some interesting little tidbits throughout this Or okay, well, firstly, there's a cute little thing where um, these minks have this quirk where, uh, you know, Carrot has to, like, nibble at, at people or at Luffy. It's just their instinct. Um, uh, Wanda has to lick people. It's, it's a cute little quirk that I find funny and led to some cool gags. But as they move their way in inwards, uh, central, we see that Wanda has a bit of a flashback where we see the devastation that was wrought by Jack. As we see all these gruesome scenes of the aftermath of this torture, it seems like. And so immediately, the arc has been pretty light so far, but this sort of dark tone settles down here as we see the subject matter. And there's obviously unease because of the fact that Wanda has Nami's clothes and Usopp is really scared of her. Uh, or scared of the situation, and it's not amicable fully, but Wanda ensures them that she will explain the situation once they get inland uh, completely and talk to the rest of the Straw Hats and explain the situation. And ultimately, eventually, they finally get to the rest of the Straw Hats, minus Sanji. We see Chopper, who is decked out. We see Nami, who is looking very beautiful uh, in this dress. Uh, there's this awesome spread as we see this uh, mink community. Um, the, 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 we see this verticality, we see this dense forest, uh, lots of branches, thick branches all over the place, and these little these little uh, huts built around the remnants of ships as well. It's beautiful. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful spread to establish uh, the inner reaches of this setting. And Luffy loves it. He's, he's, he's enamored with it, as you'd imagine he would be. And then we finally meet Nami and Chopper, and everyone's saying hi, but Nami after celebrating that she sees them again, she hugs Luffy and says in his ear, it's Sanji, with a great amount of concern and sadness, which is an immense, immense cliffhanger, after which they don't they don't initially explain a lot of it. They're very vague about what's going on with Sanji, so that had me kind of like um, chomping at the bit to see what was going on. They meet with Brooke as well, who is decked out as well, um, the last member of the group that went forwards. Uh, we, we ultimately learn throughout these chapters that a lot of the reason be behind the new clothes is that part of the mink culture, I'm paraphrasing and I might be butchering this, but the general gist is that through connecting with these people, these these mink, the mink tribe, um, part of the custom of the initial greeting and connection with one another involves exchanging clothes. So that's the deal here. Nothing malicious. Um, in fact, they're very kind. They're a very kind group, steeped in culture, which causes, uh, like, like, to a very extreme degree, which causes a bit of confusion, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, it's pretty essential to the plot, but uh, no malice at all. And, yeah, so we meet with Brooke, and we learn ultimately what happened and how they lost Sanji. The, the three Straw Hats, Chopper, Brooke, and Nami, are feeling extremely guilty and ashamed of their inability to to keep him with them. Essentially, Big Mom's pirates, along with Bege, Capone Bege, were after Caesar, and they pursued them on the high seas, and not, thanks to Nami, essentially, they fought them off, after which they landed here. So we only get this introductory part of the, 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 the stuff that led to Sanji departing, but uh, we then learn from Wanda of a few weeks ago, a few weeks prior, how Jack essentially raided them and asked for, or demanded, the location uh, or, or the delivery of someone named Rizo, a warrior from Wano named Rizo. But these people had no idea where he was, and I love this uh, quote from Wanda that says, Let me ask you this, if a vicious enemy wanted something that we do not have, how should we give it to them? as Jack came in demanding for Rizo. And the Minks essentially say, we don't know who he is, where he is, we don't know We don't know what's going on, we don't have him. Um, and it's revealed that this is, th that Jack is actually in the form of a mammoth. I didn't, I don't think I mentioned that, but he's in the form of a mammoth having raided in that form, uh, which is interesting. 
Uh, interesting bit of a contrast between him and Zunesha and what they kind of represent in a couple ways. But that aside, and he's one of Kaido's right-hand man, uh, men. I think I might have mentioned that earlier. The art is devastatingly fantastic as we see Jack continue his raid, sort of pillaging a little bit, trying to probe and understand where Raizo is. And he attacks the city even though they insist that he's not there. And the rest of the Straw Hats at this moment are going, listen, as long as we don't mention this stuff, uh, we're probably in their good books, we're probably in their good graces, but Luffy, uh, like, they're, they're thinking, just don't mention the samurai from Wano, don't mention the stuff that we learned from Kinemon, and we'll be okay. And then Luffy out loud, all the Straw Hats are thinking this, and then Luffy out loud goes, damn, so we, we won't be able to meet the uh, samurai from Wano that Kinemon was talking about? What a drag. I do love him. After physically beating him, physically assaulting him, they move on, and they're able to cover it up. They move further, further inward to the most, one of the most important people in this setting, Duke Dogstorm, who is also known in other translations as Inu, Duke Inu, uh, Inu Arashi. I'll try to call him Inu, because I, that's what I've heard is pe people refer to him as for ease. And he, he expresses tons of gratitude towards Luffy, saying, we owe you guys everything for saving us. And Luffy goes, yeah, I heard my guys help you, and but we don't know the full story. We still don't know what happened to Sanji. And Chopper says that the original reason for why this place has been devastated was due to Caesar's gas. Jack had procured one of Caesar's gas weapons and used it and caused the devastation of this destroyed region that we see. And at this point, there's a ton of lore and sort of mythos because this place is a rich is a, is a region of rich culture that we've just been dropped into. So we get a, we need to get a bit of an exposition dump, and it's a little bit overwhelming at first, but. Ultimately, I think it does the job in getting across everything that's necessary to know all the different moving pieces currently and how it got to that point and the culture that led all the characters to the to the respective spots that they're at right now. And so we dive into this sort of explanation from Inu, um, but not before he says that he um, remembers that he knows Shanks, which is very interesting and not super unexpected, I guess. Um, but he sort of dives into this bit of history and uh, lore dump, exposition dump here. We learn that there is this gigantic squabbling conflict between him, Inu, and Neko, the sort of cat equivalent and his direct antagonist, I guess you could say. Um, and such is their squabble, such is their conflict, uh, the strength of it, that they literally are awake at exact opposite times to never see each other. And it's really interesting because in spite of this conflict, they tend to work in tandem. They have some interesting chemistry because we then go back to the uh, the flashback to the takeover or the raid from Jack at which Inu sort of fended him off with him and his men. But then the sun went down and then Neko switched shifts with him and continued what he did to defeat Jack, essentially, and cause him to revert to human form. So they're very yin and yang. They're very sort of opposites attract. Um, they're always, they're obviously, they don't love each other, but they work in tandem really well. And I think that is a bit of a thematic sort of message there. Um, they're in conflict. They're opposites in this way. But only through their combined efforts were they able to f to stop this attack here. Now, of course, it's not that simple, and it progresses from here, and I, I get all that. But in the grand scheme of things, that is, I think, a big sort of element of these two together, and with their ultimate goal. And from here begins this battle of endurance, attrition, as... Neku and Inu and their forces continuously fought against Jack, whose who's, his forces kept uh, arriving by sea. And they fought for five days and for five nights. And there was no break in the deadlock until Jack brought out the gas weapon. And it's, it's really emphasized here, this guy is fearsome as hell, and he's just one of Kaido's underlings. So imagine the man himself. And his depravity and, and evil, seem it seems like, is really nailed in as we see that the gas weapon devastated the entire area. Um, and then... He captured everyone, especially the two leaders, and subjected them to such torture. Where is Raizo? Where is this warrior from Wano? And they continuously say, we don't know. The people of this land don't know. So we have nothing to tell you. 
and he subjected them to the most insane torture. It was gruesome to see, but they held strong in saying, we don't know. And so we see here that after these five days and nights and whatever, Jack left because he heard of Doflamingo's defeat, and he had to go spring him from his cage. Uh, so actually, Luffy and the Straw Hats were indirectly responsible for him leaving them alone. So that's what they heard, and they're grateful to them for that. But in addition, Sanji and the rest of the crew, their half, arrived just a day after that, it seems. And they fought off this guy named Sheep's Head, who is one of the notable members of Kaido's pirates, and... Uh, uh, they, they meet someone named Pedro, who is a great character, I love Pedro, um, who says, See to Neku and Inu, who are just strung up, chained up, uh, bloodied, beaten, and Pedro says they must be saved, they must not die under any circumstances, because the world awaits them and needs them. So that's what the curly-haired straw hat, straw hat pirates, whatever you want to call this half of the pirates, that's what they come up to. They fight off Sheep's Head, they discover this. And then from here, they told Caesar to essentially mitigate his gas to stop the weapon from, from, uh, from causing the devastation and help these people to heal once more, to build up again. And so they drive off the rest of the pirates, and the minks are saved. And we have this beautiful, like, silent montage of... Uh, Caesar is neutralizing all the gas, but like we see the, the Straw Hats helping all these others as only Straw Hats can. Chopper, Brook, Nami, uh, Sanji, and they slowly help this land to heal, and you see how much it means to them. They're, they're moved to tears. You see Wanda crying in gratitude, and you see people celebrating, and it's beautiful, and Sanji has this grin, this huge grin, that they were able to help them. And Wanda says, you had no idea who we were, and yet you rushed to save our lives. And it's just moved beyond belief. And these actions are demonstrations of who these people are, who the Straw Hats are. Like I always say, they're not heroes to everyone, but to these people, they absolutely were. And we see that Sanji has departed, and we see that Sanji has left Zo, leaving just uh, a message, a note. But it's tough to say that he can return to Zo because Zo is a moving island, so they may have to seek him out themselves. And finally, we get into an explanation of why Sanji's missing, as Brooks talks about the fact that two days ago, the Big Mom Pirates appeared, and Peckhams, who is, uh, who Zoe is his hometown, takes charge and says, don't worry, Mama, to, to Big Mom, uh, I got this, Big Zoe is my hometown, so we can do this. So here in this chapter, chapter 812, we get a bunch of insane information. Um, firstly, they're exchanging pleasantries with the minks, uh, they're generally helping them rebuild and having fun and whatever, but unfortunately, the Big Mom Pirates have come to collect Caesar and do something else. Um, Peckhams and Beige are the main spearheads of this, and they've come, and we see that the Straw Hats have evaded them, but no longer. They've caught up with them, and they're on Zoe. And we learn through this that Caesar actually was commissioned to do work for a Big Mom for some sort of weapon, but instead used her funds for his own means, so he's in trouble. And what's interesting is that Peckhams, having origins in Zoe, goes to the Straw Hats and he says, Listen, I'm very grateful for what you've done for this place. Just hand over Caesar. And, and you won't be hurt, and no one will be hurt, and it can be amicable. However, Bej is not happy with this because it goes against their mission, and he shoots Peckhams. And it's a really interesting element to both Bej and Peckhams, because we hadn't really seen this sort of wrinkle on his character, adding a bit of a new layer, but I really liked it. So Peckhams is shot, and he's left, and Bej... Uh, and everyone else goes to take Caesar, and in addition, Bej takes them into his body castle, which is an insane power, by the way, and he says that Sanji's been invited to this tea party, which is also a wedding, where he will be wedded to one of Big Mom's children. And he says, The groom is Sanji, third son of the Vinsmoke family, the bride pudding, 35th daughter of the Charlotte family. So here we get a bunch of information through just a little bit. Interestingly enough, Ichi ni San, San 3, Sanji the third son, I hadn't put that together yet, but that's a brilliant little touch here and shows that to an extent, at least some extent, Sanji's backstory and character had been thought of all the way back in his introduction 800 chapters ago, almost 800 chapters ago. Insane. Uh, and 
the third son of the Vinsmoke family seems to be a family of some repute, of some standing, if Big Mom would want to uh, marry her 35th daughter off to, to them. And then Sanji's expression here, as this is said, it's one of shock, fear, horror, uh, trauma perhaps. The reflections of a traumatic upbringing seems to be reflected in the expression there. And so, it is so much fuel for so much theory crafting. Brings forth some ideas of Kilua from Hunter x Hunter, actually. Um, and it's introduced right here in this flashback. And my mind was going wild when I first saw this. It is the exact sort of thing I was uh, hoping for. Not in terms of Sanji, because poor guy, this, this subject matter is sad. But in terms of the depth of his character, this is what I've been wanting for ages. You guys have seen me video after video say, Sanji backstory we're getting it. This is the first crumb of actual specificity before it would be expanded upon later. And interestingly enough, Brooke recognizes the Vinsmoke name. He says, it makes my skin crawl. If he had skin, he actually says, my backbone crawl. But it can't be. So the Vinsmoke family is this family of renown. And then we get flashbacks. We see that San when Sanji said that he was born in the North Blue, he had heard of Noland. Bej says that Sanji, looking at him now, seems like the apple falls far from the tree. And sorry, Sanji said he was uh, born in the North Blue, but raised in the East. And then he said, uh, never mind that. He's always been very evasive. He's always, there's always been tidbits about his backstory and where he's grown up, but he's never expanded upon it. And he's always avoided it. And now we see why, because it was a source of great trauma. And Obviously, you have to cross the red line to get to the north blue from the east blue, as Brooke explains. So that's a big deal. And his experience with the red line and all the stuff, it's its very, it speaks for itself. While not speaking for itself quite enough, because I do want, I, I did want more. But man, I was getting fed at this point. And obviously, this stuff is huge because of what it means for Sanji. He's going to be marrying into the family of an emperor. As huge as his family is... Um, that's a gigantic step as well. But Sanji says, You think our captain will want to work with someone like you, with, with, with you guys? No. Luffy is the man who will be king of the pirates. Beautiful. And he says that I have no obligation to do this. Bej says that they're in his body and he's kind of, he's already heading there and his hands are tied. And Sanji still is reluctant and not wanting to do it. Obviously because he's had this whole new lease on life since he's joined Luffy's crew. Um... You know, he was freed when he joined with Zeph, but freed from completely, with from obligation, from everything when he joined Luffy's crew. So obviously he doesn't want to go back to where he's been, but the rest of the Straw Hats are threatened, and Vito, one of, one of Big Mom's pirates, um, whispers something in his ear, which causes him to write the message. And he writes it, and he intends to go with them. Clearly a threat to those he, he holds dear, which your heart just goes out for him, uh, out to him. And he says to Nami and everyone else, I never meant to deceive you. I never meant to hide anything from you. Nami, Chopper, Brook, I'm, I never meant to. My past was never meant to come back for me again, but now it's time for me to face it once and for all. And so Bej takes Sanji and Caesar back to, back to Big Mom. And right before Sanji leaves for good, he says, I will be back with this classic smile, reminiscent of when he was talking to Luffy about the all blue, and he's gone. And we see the note in the, uh, that, that we, that's the subject of much debate in the present, and it just says, to the crew, I'm gonna meet a woman, I will be back. And there is such weight and gravity behind this. It is uh, so sad, because we don't know the specifics, but just because of the way in which Sanji reflects on his family, and just, uh, the contrast from which we clearly see his life here with his life there, and uh, the obligation and the threats, there is just so much, there's clearly so much negativity with regards to what he's doing, but he has to do it to protect them. He thought he could escape his past and he can't, and he says he's going to fight it head on, or face it head on, and we don't know what necessarily that means directly, but it takes immense courage and care for those he loves. Interestingly enough, the Straw Hats are talking about what to do, and Zoro, one of the crewmates who has the biggest connection with Sanji, he says that, you know, we've already got Kaido's ire. Maybe it's not the best idea to get Big Mom's either. And he's kind of avoidant about it. He's kind of laying it back and just going, well, maybe that's it. Maybe he's, maybe he's just gonna 
going to cast off and metaphorically with a sorry for all the trouble and the thanks for everything. And he's saying, we have this imminent threat of Kaido, so we can't take, we, we, maybe we can't handle Big Mom too, thinking realistically. Which is interesting for someone like Zoro, but also keeping, in, in one way, sort of contrasts his, um, you know, the, the way he is the Straw Hat, the, the way he is a member of the Straw Hats who don't really have impossible in their vocabulary. But on the other, it's tinged with that realism that a first mate has to have. And, but you can also see he feels upset by this. He is kind of spiraling a little bit. He is unraveling a little bit, being really angry at Sanji. So I don't think he's being entirely truthful when he says, let's just leave it. I think he's angry. He's like, why would that twirly-eyed freak, twirly-eyebrow freak leave us like this? Uh, he's really angry. And I think it's because he's genuinely worried. I, I really do think that. And Luffy just goes, but you know what? We got to go just ask him ourselves. We just got to go ourselves. He is our crewmate and we're not going to just leave him. And to be honest, Luffy has already angered Big Mom. So what's a little bit more anger? We get a bit more dialogue here with Pedro, who, like I said, I really, really like as a character. And then we see that Neko and Peckhams are both recovering. And Peckham's here, uh, when we're, is talking to the Straw Hats as Chopper's trying to take care of him, and he goes that the Vin Smoke family is a family of killers, which brings up even more of the Kilua parallel uh, with Sanji. And, you know, from here you wonder, uh, even more so, was Sanji just too kind-hearted for this? Was it, was it not in his blood, uh, or rather not in his soul, in his heart, to be a part of this profession? Maybe his father tried to strong arm, or, or strong arm all his children into it, um, but he just was never built for it. Emotionally, psychologically, he never wanted to hurt people in that way. He wanted to bring people together, not destroy lives. Bring people together with food. That 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 further deepens the dynamic here. The Vin Smoke family, led by his father, commands this under underworld army, Germa sixty six. Um, now, obviously, when Sanji gets married to Pudding, he will become a member of the Big Mom Pirates, he will go back to his home, and so he will be deeply embedded there. The Straw Hats will... it'll be much tougher for the Straw Hats to get him back once he's enraptured there. So, they gotta stop this from going down. Luffy acquaints himself with Law and his, uh, Law's crew, uh, because Law's crew is here, uh, like we mentioned earlier, and um, Law, kind of similar to the logic that Zoro has, tries to get Luffy, uh, tries to, like, make him see that they've alre they're already in a precarious position. Is this a good idea? And then he says, also think of this country. What happens of this country if we go and attack them? There will be repercussions for them. So think of that as well. And I don't, it's not something that's ever going to stop Luffy from doing what he wants to do, but it's some larger, out-of-the-box out thinking that I think is very appropriate. There's a party throne, and then we have Frankie, Brooke, and Robin all guarding it, uh, guarding the island to make sure that Kanjudo and Kinemon don't make their way back on because of the, the, the huge cultural problems that that could cause. Um, and they're going, listen, the reason they're coming here is not here. Raizo is not here, so they have no reason to be here. It'll also cause so much conflict, we just can't allow them to come in. So they're waiting by the outskirts of Zo for this. But they fall asleep, and then they enter Zo. <laughs> There's a mink messenger that uh, goes off after hearing their samurai, seeing their samurai, to tell the rest of the uh, the inhabitants about it. So there's this huge commotion as they try to search out for the samurai, everyone, um, Kinemon and Kanjudo. And they meet up with uh, Momonosuke, which is cool to see them together after a little while. Uh, the, the Kanjudo and Kinemon, of course. Then Neko and Inu have a bit of a squabble, uh, once again, butting heads as they tend to do. They see each other here, despite cooperating in a way um, prior. But then Kinemon, ill-advised to do so, comes, comes out of nowhere and says to cease this squabble to Neko and Inu. Um... And everyone's panicking. Everyone's panicking. Usopp's panicking. He's going, oh, they mean you no ill will. Just, just don't worry, or whatever. And then Kinemon says that he is a servant of the Kozuki clan. He's here in search of his compatriot Raizo. And he asks, has he come to your land? And Oda kind of flips the script here. Because we, he had been feeding us the idea that Raizo is nowhere here. He tortured this entire, uh, this entire village. And no one gave it up because they had no info, right? That's why this place was completely destroyed. Of course he's not here. 
But then Neko sees them, descendants of the Kozuki clan, or members of the Kozuki clan, and says, in one of my favorite spreads in the last little while in all of One Piece, Raizo is alive and well, as they bow down to Kanjudo and Kinemon and Momo. Inu and Neko both say this, they both grin, and this is the this seems to be this uh, core foundation of an alliance between the two. And it's said, since long in the past we have been like brothers to the Kozuki clan of Wano. No matter what should befall us, we would never sell a comrade to an enemy. So they endured all that pain, not because they didn't know, but because they weren't able to, they weren't willing to sell him out because of their friends, because of their connection with their friends, because of their agreement and principles and loyalty. And Luffy at this beams because that is right up his alley. That's the exact sort of thing that he would do. And so he sees kindred spirits here. A magnificent moment, beautiful little moment. We get a quick glimpse of Jack after his fight. Um, presumably uh, with the Doflamingo stuff we saw earlier with the Marines. Um, and he's very injured, but he seems to be okay. And then we cut back to Zoe, where Kinemon shows that there's a, a the emblem of the Kozuki clan on his chest. On his back, excuse me. Uh, and, you know, that's the big revelation. That's a big pro plot revelation. But then Neko and Inu start arguing again. And Momo, Momonosuke, gets very upset at this, saying that my father would be very upset to see you two, who have been so loyal to us, such great friends to us, argue like this. And so this reveals that Momonosuke is not Kinemon's son, but rather the son of Odin, the daimyo of Kuri in Wano. So Momonosuke is royalty. And this is... In terms of obviously the plot twist, I don't have much to say about the execution of it. It's well done. It, it pulled one over on me. I didn't really suspect much with regards to Momonosuke and Kinemon. I d didn't really think much of, a, much of it. Um, but what it does specifically for Momo's character is really key. And we'll be talking about this in a little bit, but I've never been a huge fan of Momonosuke, to be honest. I've never found him super interesting. I just, you know, he had this perverted thing with Robin and Nami, and he had some bits here and there. I just never, I never really found it super interesting, to be honest. But I think this opens up a huge avenue of possibility for his character and where his character can go, because primarily of his sort of, uh, the expectations thrust on him. And how he interacts with others, and how Luffy plays into that. But we'll get to that in a little bit. I just want to say that this is a very exciting direction for his character. Actually, I can talk a little bit of it right now, because what happens right here is that Luffy says, so what, when hearing that Momonosuke's royalty. So what? Luffy's never cared for reputation. He just sits there picking his nose going, so what? I, that doesn't change how I feel about Momonosuke. That doesn't change anything. I'm going to talk to him the same way. Why should I change anything? He's the same person. And it's really interesting because Momonosuke goes, grovel at my feet, Luffy. Uh, lower yourself when you speak to me. And Luffy goes, no way. How come you being some fancy guy means the rest of us have to change how we act, you stupid jerk? And so they're fighting. They're squabbling. They're quarreling. They're just going back and forth. And I think it, there's, something, there's something there. There's something beautiful about that because Momonosuke has likely throughout his entire life been interacting with people who put him on a pedestal and he's used to it and he thinks of it as the way of the world it's kind of similar to maybe do flamingo a little bit but he i don't think he's had many people like luffy if any who just talk to him for who he is rather than his title rather than his uh looking at him as royalty they just looks he just looks straight through to who he is at heart and talks to him like someone who's his equal because he really is and so I don't think he's had much of that in his life. And I think that Luffy being that for him could be very special. And they touch more on that aspect further down the line. But this interaction is where I first thought about that. So the Straw Hats find their way to Raizo, who is being hidden. And they see that he's tied to a Poneglyph, uh, which is really interesting. Robin immediately perks up there. Um, there's some funny interactions as he kind of, there's a bit of a Naruto reference as he uses these ninja arts to uh, to dazzle some of them. Um, but the Poneglyph is something that's very key. And there's this beautiful spread where Raizo looks out at all the devastation that's been wrought um, after the Minks defended him, defended their agreement with, uh, with the Kozuki clan. 
and he says, I will do my utmost to make sure that this is made right. To which Luffy smiles very silently. And it's a beautiful little scene where he he's on board. He's on board with Raizo. But then we get some lore about the Poneglyphs. And we see from Robin, who says that these have to be... Her, her and uh, Nami kind of work it out together. And they realize that these are road Poneglyphs. And the final destination that they point to is Raftel. And that's the end goal. That's where they're trying to go. This is monumental. However, the key here is that there are four road poneglyphs. Um, there are there are four, and only through getting all four, collecting all four, seeing their locations and the locations they correspond to. Once you have all four coordinates and you connect them, that the center of that, the apex, uh, is where Raftel is. I had some funny things on stream where I was just like, "Do you really need four? Do you, do you really need four if you do that? Uh, what if you just have three? Can you still get it? I don't know. You, you do need four, but there was a lot of funny stream stuff with that. But this is gigantic because this is... Obviously, One Piece is, a, is, is about the journey, but this decrees where they have to go. This shows us what the ultimate goal is and the methodology to get there. These Poneglyphs. So here they have one, but there are three more. One's in an unknown location, and the other two are in the possession of emperors who they seem to be going up against regardless. Big Mom and Kaido are in possession of the other road Poneglyphs. So, hey, it's it's easy. It's on the way. It's not easy, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and throughout all this, Neko says to Robin, your ability to read this, especially with the importance of road Poneglyphs, is pretty essential and people will be after you because of this. And very sweetly, Robin just smiles very simply and says, I don't mind. After all, I've got very powerful friends who will protect me. Not a doubt in her mind that her friends who she loves will be there for her and will not let anything like this happen to her. After Annie's lobby, it really... it makes me a little bit emotional. Um, it's really beautiful. So a bit more lore here is that the Poneglyphs are said to have been created by the Kozuki clan, who were stonemasons, who put that knowledge and engraved it into stone. And that knowledge was cut off after Kaido killed Odin, is what is, is, what is stated here. Odin was killed, and as a result, now Kaido resides in Wano. Wano has been overtaken by Kaido and his men. Such immense buildup for Kaido and for Wano as an arc. Once again, Oda planting seeds for arcs, two or three arcs in advance, uh, because that's just what he does. That's what you do. You, you plan things in parallel, you stagger them to make the story feel as rich and organic as possible, and to make multiple parallel builds up buildups feel natural when they come to fruition. It's it's beautiful stuff. But Odin, Momo's father, was executed because he rode with Goldie Roger to Raftel and found out some immense secrets of the world. And that knowledge is coveted, and that's the reason that he was killed. Kaido was trying to get that information. Zoe is an incredible arc. There is so much density in everything that's going on here. In all the all the lore that is that is given to us, all the exposition, all the new dimensions to so many things we thought were true. It's incredible. It's so dense. So Odin, Momonosuke's dad, went to Raftel, discovered the utmost secrets of the world with Goldie Roger. That is gigantic. Like, these... And that just lends more credence to the idea that I think Momo and Luffy are kind of... I don't want to say destined, but kind of destined, it feels like, to be very important to one another. Momo, the son of Odin, who seems to be this legendary person who was one of Goldie Roger's partners who discovered these utmost, the, the, these monumental secrets of the land, uh, of the world. And Luffy, who is not Goldie Roger's son, that is Ace, but who, in a way, is his legacy. And these two and how they interact, I feel like they'll be very important together. Anyways, Kinemon, Kanjudo, and Momo... I'm still sus of Kanjido. I'm not gonna lie, I'm still sus. But they have this beautiful scene where they say they intend to take back Wano from, from Kaido, and they ask for the Straw Hats' help. They ask for help from all their comrades. And that is the goal, to take back their home. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful emotional foundation for Wano as an arc. Uh, I really, it just gets me so excited for Wano for whenever we get there, because... This is such a such build up for it, such immense, um, like I said, emotional an emotional foundation for it, and there's so much there as well. These 
Raftel things, the 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 core symbolic core of Odin and his connection with Roger. I imagine that could be pretty important. What it means for Momo, what it means for Luffy, maybe they're this generation's Odin and Roger. Maybe not exactly, but you know, they're they have this connection, I think inherently. And so they ask for the Straw Hat's help. They ask for Luffy's help. But Luffy says no. And I love this. This is beautiful. This is more like Luffy and Momo in these past couple of chapters have more of a dynamic than they've had for whatever dozens of chapters they had prior to this. This is incredible stuff for the two of them because Luffy says no. It's exactly the sort of thing that Luffy would do. He says no. He says to Momo, don't you have power over all these men? And you're just going to sit there and cry. And Momo thinks back to these words said to him. Gaze out upon it. That is the world, Momonosuke. I imagine his father said these to him. As we get this beautiful panel of him wiping away his tears and looking up to Luffy. And we get this flash beautifully done to all these bits of trauma. Uh, we are surrounded. Light the fires. Momo screams for his mother. Probably the invasion. You must flee. There's an escape route. Everyone flee. And then Kaido says, your father is a fool of a lord. And Momo yells, screams out, I want to defeat Kaido. His mother died, his father died to Kaido. He wants to grow up, he wants to take this agency with his own two hands. He wants to protect people on his own. But he says, I'm too small, I cannot do it, so I want you to help me fight. He says that to Luffy. And then Luffy goes, okay, you know what, I get it. Now that Momo has said for himself, without being passive, but taking this for, with his own two hands, saying... Please help me. I want to do this. I will do it, but I need some help. And Luffy goes, all right, we've got an alliance here. We'll take down Kaido. And he grabs his arm and he's like, I'm unworthy. And Luffy goes, no, nah, you gotta, you gotta grab it with some power. You know, it's beautiful stuff. It's beautiful. Luffy is this immensely um, down to earth, grounded role model that Momonosuke needs at this point in his life. I think he's going to be essential to Momo. And he says, an alliance together like this means we're friends. And Law in the back goes wrong, being his soon today self. And so they throw this party to celebrate this alliance, but Zack, Zack? Jack is on his way back to Zoe because he wants to destroy the elephant itself. They come up to the elephant's location. And so instead of invading, they're just going to take out the elephant entirely. Uh, we get some more revelations. They just lay them on us. As we see, see that Neko and Inu were actually part of the crew that sailed with Odin and Goldie Roger. And of course, as a result of this, um, we understand the Shanks connection. And Raizo knows of Shanks as well. And Rayleigh, of course. Uh, and Luffy just overjoyed with all these connections. And I'm just thinking about Buggy. I'm just thinking about Buggy a little bit. Uh, but anyway, but we also learn through a bit of exposition as Neko and Inu want to talk to Marco for an alliance. But they're not super optimistic because we hear that they attacked the White Beard, the Blackbeard pirates and lost uh, a year ago. This is called the Grudge War, but they were defeated. So they don't have much hope of finding Marco for this alliance, but they're going to try. And I really hope they do. I think they will. Because it just makes sense for me for the flow in the story for them to, to meet up with Marco and for Marco to have this role and for Whitebeard's pirates to sort of be this echo, this inherited will echo of Whitebeard's legacy. Uh, I think that makes sense uh, in this new era. Uh, so I, I think they'll find him. But uh, interesting, and I love to have Marco back in the story, but interesting to hear this. And Robin, who knows about this, who's clearly been, seen a bunch of information through what she was doing this whole time, um, says that it was only after this fight that uh, that Blackbeard was considered a, a, an emperor of the sea. And so we get ready to set out here. Luffy intends to go to Whole Cake Island with all the characters that were not in Dressrosa, or the end of the Dressrosa arc. Nami, Chopper, Brook. And I like it because it splits up the Straw Hats in a way that keeps things fresh, or gives uh, emphasis on the ones who were not present in Dressrosa. Just a good balancing of the of the cast uh, from Oda here. And it makes sense because a lot of them feel, all of them feel guilty that they let Sanji go. So they want to make up for that. So it just makes sense. It's very smart, very clever. It's sharp, it's on point. Meanwhile, Law will take the other Straw Hats to Wano. Robin wants to read the Poneglyph, they have this alliance, and at the same time, Neko will search for Marco. But as they're about to head out, there's this sort of tremor, and Luffy hears a voice. And this voice says, if you're there, do it quickly. And both Luffy and Momo can hear it. Very similar to how Luffy could hear the Sea Kings in Fishman Island, just like Roger could, Momo can hear this as well. 
maybe Odin could. The select people. Non. This is. I think this has something else, something different to do with the D, because I don't think Law can hear it. But these select people, these spiritual uh, people of influence or this certain spirit they have, they can hear these things. Luffy is one, Momo's another, Roger was another, Odin might have been one. And so this is Zunesha uh, talking to them as they are under attack by Jack, who is trying to bring down the elephant. And it says, hurry, give me the order if you are there. And its eyes are brightened. And Luffy screams, what order? Like, give, what do you mean give you the order? Who are you? Explain. And all of, obviously, the crewmates have no idea what's going on. But Zunesha is telling Luffy and Momo to tell it what to do. It is bound unless they tell it, they give it orders. And Momo realizes what's going on, that Z that Jack is attacking Zo. And in this beautiful sequence, one of the, oh, an immense chapter here. So sweeping, so epic, and grand, and integration of of, of backstory and current emotional uh, character writing with, with Momo's arc. It, it says... It hurts if I collapse, you're all in danger. And Momo realizes that Zo itself is the source of the voice. And Zo says, A long time ago, the elephant committed a crime, and ever since it's only been allowed to walk, it must continue following its orders. Therefore, I just need permission this once. Give me the order to fight. And this is really interesting because the specificity of this is strange. Who? What was the? What was the crime it committed? Why was it cursed to roam the sea like this? Was it specifically to these people that can hear it? Was it specifically to Momo's ancestry? Because the emphasis, Luffy and Momo can both hear it, but Luffy says, I think you need to say it. And the emphasis is on Momo having to say it. And Momo says, screams in this immense character moment, don't give up, Zo, don't collapse, drive Jack away. To which this is so epic. Oh, it's so, I'm getting chills just thinking about it right now. To which Zo, Zunisha, says, understood. And in one of the best spreads in One Piece, period, Zunisha awakens, takes his trunk, just does a sweep across Jack's ships, and just batters them out of the way. Uh, almost an entirely full page, full page uh, double spread. Um, pretty much is. The illustration, beautiful. The, just this hulking, uh, this hulking creature. This creature that is equal parts carrying with it such history and such weight. And you can feel the sins, the sunken in eyes. Like I mentioned earlier, it has this ominous, dark feel to it. I think part of it is this crime it committed. It's punishment. But here it's awakened, and it does this. And it's so empowering for Momonosuke and for it. We don't have specifics, but it being able to do this, there's just this thrill to it as he bats Jack away. And it just looks beautiful. It, it looks uh, unbelievable. And the dust settles, and a poo on uh, the the snail transponder uh, talks to Kaido and says that they and says that we, they don't have any contact with Jack anymore and Chopper decides that he's going to uh, help take care of Zo heal up its wound but he says something that is so evocative or this might not have been Chopper this might have been someone he was with um, who says, Zunesha has been our homeland for a thousand years. We've enjoyed its comfortable safety from the day we were born, so perhaps we have forgotten something important, a fact with which we are confronted with anew today, that we have always been given life and support by this great being below us, and that every life must eventually come to an end. If it does have a will, then I will ask it a question. For these thousand years, what have you been walking towards? And it just leaves us with that. It just cuts off there. And that it just inspires such wonder and such thought. What has it been walking towards? Zunesha is one of my favorite concepts in One Piece. Um, in a way, you could say it's an embodiment of the the journey, the detours. Uh, sort of a dark tinge, never knowing. Like, no one ever knows what it's going towards, but it walks nonetheless. Deliberately, painstakingly, it walks. That is kind of the journey that Luffy takes. He has this grand goal, but he never gets too far in front of himself. He, he looks of it in the great beyond, but he never loses sight of putting one step in front of the other. And if he does lose sight of it, he has his friends to check him. Momo says that he wants to wait here to have a conversation and, and converse with Zunesha. So he's going to stay here with Inu, um, 
and Team Luffy is going to Whole Cake Island with all the ones I said prior. Uh, Team Neko is going to search for Marco, and Team Kinemon with Law and Zoro and the rest of the Straw Hats are going to Wano. And so they're all going their separate ways, and their plan is to do all this stuff and ultimately meet up in Wano for this revolution against Kaido. And just talking about it like that now is so thrilling. Whole Cake Island is great, and I will save her every second I'm there. Um, but I can't. I, I really can't wait for Wano. I can't wait to see what goes down there. Will they get Marco? I don't know. I like I said. I imagine so, but we'll see. And then how will Momo tie in here? Odin the legacy of Odin. Luffy and everyone, once he gets them all, brings them back to, to with, with Team Kinemon and Law and everyone. It is all set up beautifully. As they're about to depart, Luffy goes to Peckham's because they need to go, and Peckham's is going to be with them. And Pedro sort of volunteers himself, dedicates himself to this journey, and he says that the idea that not a single mink would take part in this mission, aside from Peckham's, it would be a stain on their honor. So he needs to take part in this. Um, it is... It is what the Straw Hats are owed. It is part of their, it is a symbol of their friendship. And all these other ones want to go. Wanda wants to go. Uh, all these other, all these other, other minks want to go as well. But Pedro ends up being the only one to go. There's some cute stuff as Usopp and Nami are talking about her climb attack and uh, how she can approach combat going forward with it. Some, cu some cute stuff like that. And they say goodbye to their, the other Straw Hats. Zoro says, the samurai of Wano are going to be following my lead before long. Um, and they depart. And Luffy jumps off Zoe towards the ship. Bit ill-advised. But then, oh man, I, this is, you guys know me. And you must have known that I would, uh, I would, uh, I can't even talk. At the end of this chapter, 822, we get a cut to Alabasta. And we see for the first time in the story, in 600 chapters, Vivi. Meanwhile, on the Grand Line... Fuck off! <gasps> I miss her! The Princess of Alabasta, taking in the open wind, with all the people around her just being like, Vivi, chill out! She is a straw hat in spirit. I don't care. She, she's a straw hat full stop. She's just not with them right now. But it was so, so wonderful to see her again. It, what a beautiful time to have her back into the story. And it's plot relevant too. Some more setting up because what is she doing? Her and her father, Cobra, who is looking very sickly. He seems essentially bound to a chair, to his wheelchair. He's not looking in great shape. And that does make me quite sad. Uh, but they're gearing up to go to the reverie because Cobra, thinking of Robin, what, it, what, he, what he learned from Robin, has questions for the world government and the truth of the world. So that's something I'll be following with great interest. I'm sure there's going to be some sort of like reverie arc or if maybe it's tied onto the Wano arc. I don't know. Um, probably not because One Piece tends to divide it by location and reverie is not going on in Wano. So I imagine there's going to be a reverie arc. Um, and so many, oh god, there's going to be so much density in that. I can't wait for that, uh, if it happens. But either way, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's just what happens when I see Vivi. It's beautiful to see her back, Cobra, uh, Pell, the whole Alabasta crew. They're all on their way to Reverie, and it's so great to see them again. And then, in addition to that, we also see... Oh, well, firstly, we see that Vivi's got tons of suitors for, for a husband, and she's not interested. She says, toss them all out. Queen shit. Uh, then after that, we see uh, the Queen of Goa is getting ready to go to the Reverie. Um, King Steli, who we saw in post-war, the flashback. And we get some narration that says, The countries of the world are in a restless state due to an event that happens once every four years in the holy land of Marajoa in the center of the world, the Reverie. Here... At the highest conference, uh, very highest of conferences, the monarchs of 50 nations come together to discuss and debate the world's most serious topics, and agree upon a shared direction of the future. But given the prudent and cantankerous natures of the most powerful of figures, the meetings are not always tranquil. So, Don Chin Zhao, my guy, they, they're talking about Sai and how he's not been, and how he's not returned yet, um... 
but they're on their way to the reverie as well. Uh, we see the evil black drum kingdom in the south blue <sighs> with Wapple. The cherry blossom kingdom with Dalton and Kureha who are making the trip. Uh, lovely to see them again. Dress Rosa, we see Rebecca, Viola, and they're going. More recent, but lovely to check in with them. And um, in the kingdom of Podence, or Prodence, excuse me, King Riku. And Fishman Island, we see Shirahoshi, beautiful to see her again, who is scared. She's she's scared, but but nonetheless, she says, I ma Luffy made a promise to me. When we meet again, he's going to take me on a walk in a real forest up on the surface. And after some convincing from her brothers and King Neptune, they make it clear that this was our mother's greatest wish, so let's go together. And I think it cuts off there, but I think that's enough. Beautiful to see them again. Love Fishman Island. Beautiful to see them again. Love Fishman Island. And back with the crew, everyone's a bit rattled because uh, of what Luffy did in jumping off of Zoe. And then we see that Carrot stowed herself and decided to join the Straw Hats. So we have two minks, Pedro and Carrot. Uh, them, both of them accompanying them to Whole Cake Island. And I love this. Um, in the Whole Cake Island video, we'll talk about it a bit more, but I quickly realized that Carrot was absolutely my type of character. Not because she's very deeply written or anything, though that may become the case eventually, but just because she's the type of personality that I really love. She's extremely adorable, extremely cute, endearing, silly, goofy, just generally, I love her presence. She's a beautiful presence. She makes me smile all the time I see her. She's drawn beautifully by Oda. She's so cute. Um, whether she's cheering, laughing, uh, comically crying, you know, uh, hugging the other members, she's just a joy to have on screen. I just love seeing her there. Anyways, I'm rambling. I love Carrot. I, I really love her, so I'm so glad she joined the Straw Hats uh, on, this, on this voyage along with Pedro. She is the best. She deserves the world. She's the cutest. I've heard that the anime, like, people actually don't really like her in the anime. They find her kind of grating. I can't speak to that because I haven't seen the anime, but in the manga, I adore her. And there's a lot of hijinks. It's very chaotic as she reveals herself, and there's interactions all over the place, and it's very silly and endearing and fun. But then Pedro reads a newspaper where it says that Baltigo, the HQ of the Revolutionary Army, has been dismantled. And Luffy reads it and he sees Sabo, he goes, oh man, that's Sabo, I know Sabo. And then he kind of had forgotten that Dragon was his dad. And then we get some dialogue here from Nami where she goes, Robin said she was with him all that time, don't you remember? So yeah, that's the stuff I was talking about earlier. <laughs> but yeah, the stuff that's been bubbling in the background, Blackbeard and the revolutionaries, it becomes news, it happens, and it seems that they've defeated them, but I don't think it's that simple. I think Dragon and Sabo and Koala, I think they likely escaped or have some sort of plan. I just don't think it's that simple. But the world building in this series, my god. And Pedro kind of alludes to the thing I just said, which is that Luffy's worried about Sabo, but Pedro says, like, if these very important people in the Revolutionary Army were killed, and it was known, that would be in the news. And it's not. Um, there's an ongoing gag with, because they don't have Sanji as a cook, it's a little bit sad as well, they have to endure horrible cooking from Luffy. Or rather, I don't remember if it was actually that horrible. It might have been, it might not have been. But he does leave the stove on, and cause a fire, and that's not great. Back on Zoe, they realize that Carrot's gone, that Carrot's missing. Um, Inu kind of prepares or readies the defenses in case there are any further attacks. Meanwhile, Jack has sunk in the ocean and is just kind of blub blubbing and saying, please fish me out. He doesn't say please, but you know. Um, he's a little bit, he's in a precarious position. Then we cut to a certain land where we see Kaido, who is in a rage because of Jack's failure. And he's just raging everywhere, which is an interesting sort of touch to his character that I hadn't really seen prior to this. And we see Kid, Eustace Kid, Eustace Captain Kid, bloody, torn apart it looks like, um, seems to be a target of Kaido's rage. As Kaido is just miserable talking about and thinking about and uh, raging about, the worst generation, Luffy, Law. He says, Little Whelps proud of wiping out mere warlords of the sea, but you must realize that you've messed with my business. Warn those idiots in your generation. Run away while you can. All we were doing was playing pirates, used as Captain Kid. Captain in quotations. As we see Kid in a horrible state. So there are levels to this that are being established here. Kaido thinks that there are levels. Kaido looks at the worst generation, even warlords, and says they're they're nothing. I am beyond all that. So let them know that they're taking on more than they're they're taking they're biting off more than they can chew. 
And again, more establishment for Kaido, more beautiful stuff that I think will be essential for Wano. We then cut to the crew for a bit, and then cut to Sanji, who is on the ship with Baron Tamago. And, you know, Tamago says to him that this is what your father demands and desires, and Sanji says, we've been through for ages. Again, another little seed for their relationship and their dynamic. But then Sanji says, the only use for these hands of mine is to cook food for my companions, nothing else. I'm here to clear this up. As he reminisces and says, I bet they miss my food. I wish I could cook for them. It's very sad. And then ultimately we get shown a picture of Pudding, who is a beautiful woman. And Sanji's hard eyes come popping out. And um, we see her, and she's established, and this is where the Zoar arc ends. Fantastic arc. There, it's a bit hard for me to find a cohesive overall theme for this, but there's lots of lots of other themes that I think merge together in this beautiful package. Obviously, tons of amazing lore, uh, amazing plot progression, lots of catching up with characters around the world, build up for the Reverie, build up for Wano, symbolic thematic stuff. Uh, being laid, foundations being laid for both of the, uh, for Whole Cake Island, Wano, potentially the Reverie, um, beautiful stuff, uh, great hooks for Sanji's character, lots of mechanical great stuff like that, I, I love all that stuff. In terms of themes, um, uh, th like I said, this sort of inherent, inherited sentiment across generations for the Kozgi clan and how they protected uh, 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 Raizo and Neko and Inu, who, despite squabbling, have shared this common sentiment. Uh, Momo uh, and the idea of his character and his dynamic with Luffy and them being this these potential new age sons of Odin and kind of Roger, like I said, through legacy uh, and their relationship, which I think could be very special. The wonder of Zunesha and what is it walking towards? What does it see? What was its crime? Such beautiful tidbits throughout. Um, and the Minx tribe and their culture, which was very rich, very interesting. Uh, loved all the characters that were introduced. Love Carrot, love Pedro. We'll get more of them in Whole Cake. Uh, more stuff for Kaido, bit, a bit for Kid. Uh, like, what? what is his role gonna be? His, his role has been different than I've thought from the beginning. I thought he'd be, be a bit more prominent, but he's just kinda, he's been torturing people in the background. We saw a bit of that, then being destroyed, being beaten up. I don't know what to expect with Kid. Uh, I, and I don't think fighting Shanks is gonna be a good idea for him, but we'll see. Uh, all the division going, uh, we have Neko going for Marco, we have Luffy and Co. going to Whole Cake Island with Carrot and Pedro, uh, then Zoro, Law, Kinemon, everyone else going to Wano, waiting for them there, uh, which, I mean, we might be, we might not see Zoro and Usopp and Co. for a while, which is a bit sad, but that's how it's gotta be, that's how it was in Dressrosa, um, and then we have, uh, Momo and Inu and Wanda and everyone back on Zo trying to commune with Zunesha. With Big Mom on the horizon, with Sanji, family stuff, uh, all the substantial stuff we got here, it is cooking big time. Um, Zo is a great arc. It's a strong 8 or a light 9 out of 10 around there. It was great. I really have no complaints. I It did so much and did it so well. And I actually think I'm going to hold off on my character ranking for this because there are a couple of changes. Um, some stuff with Sanji some stuff with maybe, I don't know if Momo would make his way into the honorable mentions, but he's got tons of potential. Um, but it, overall, there's not really any huge changes. I think the whole Cake Island ranking is going to be where the changes happen, and the changes this time around will be minimal. So I'll just roll on screen my honorable mentions and top characters from Dress Rosa because it really is very minimally different this time around. So no changes for this video, but next one, I imagine there'll be quite a bit. Thank you guys so much for joining me on my review of Zo. If you want to check out my Whole Cake Island review, uh, that'll be on Patreon right now for early access. Um, you can watch that right after this one if you'd like. If you want to check out the streams, where we stream every single arc, every single chapter, rather, um, and we're always chatting and discussing the characters and the themes and the plot and theorizing, it's always so much fun. You can follow me on Twitch where we do that with every single chapter. We do it with Naruto as well. Uh, we're going to be doing it with Bleach once I'm done with Naruto. Um, yeah, it's the place to be for sure. Join the Discord server if you want to discuss any of those series, One Piece ongoing, even if it has nothing to do with my videos or streams. Feel free. It's a great community. And uh, I think that's about it. 
If you want to share your thoughts, please do so. If you want them to be part of the AJP's comments, just be sure to use the hashtag AJP's and it'll be entered into that pool. Thank you so much for watching. I can't wait to talk about Whole Cake Island next. Zoe was fantastic, and you know those things about post time skip being um, a downgrade after compared to pre time skip. I I knew it probably wasn't true. It isn't true. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.